I was good again that the day that's coming is glorious. Uh, and uh, things might be bad in the world and they might get worse yet, but uh, there's a better day coming. Yeah. Well, it's good to be with you here again. Um, have you enjoyed these studies in, in Revolution? Yep, good. I'm one week behind you because I just get, to, I just get them on the internet. It's, uh, I have enjoyed uh, listening to Graham speaking. And, um, it's been uh, interesting, isn't it? Good to ken that the Lord has revealed what's to come and uh, that we've got a hope that's eternal. And, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about the condition of the world. It's not out of control. It's in control. Um, and uh, the Lord knows exactly what he's doing. So tonight we're going to be reading in Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7, and we're going to read the whole chapter, which is quite a read, but um, I trust it'll be a blessing to us. So verse 1 says this, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were healed, sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 11,000 were sealed. I'm just checking out to see if you're still listening. <laughs> of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were healed. S sealed, sorry. That was a genuine mistake. Then. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. And after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed, arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to, her, to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <clears throat> Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them, and they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountain of water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And we trust God would bless uh, the reading of his word tonight. <clears throat> Now, as I said, I am actually one chapter behind you in your study of Revelation, so I don't really know what was said last week in chapter 6. But uh, chapter 6 really begins to tell us what's going to happen in this great period called the, the Great Tribulation. And uh, I'm sure that as you read it last uh, week, um, there was a sense of a, a seriousness and, and understanding how bad things will be in that day. You know, the, the, the second horseman, he gets a great sword, and he take, and war it covers the earth. Uh, and after him, the, the next horseman, he, he gets a, a scales, 
and uh, it pictures famine that covers the earth. And then, of course, the fourth horseman, he, he gets, um, well, he gets an accomplice with him, and he rides out on the earth, and a quarter of the population of the earth die, and his accomplice is hell that rides behind him on another horse. And these are really serious pictures of a day that's going to dawn and break on this world. And so bad are the situation that we read in the next uh, seal that the, the, those who are martyred for their faith, they're crying to God for vengeance on the earth and they're told to wait. And then in the last, uh, sorry, the sixth seal, God acts in tremendous power. Uh, Isaiah speaks about it. It says that he rises and shakes terribly the earth. And, and you read there, of course, how that the moon uh, turns to blood, the sun is darkened, um, the stars fall from heaven, the sky rolls open like a scroll, rolls away like a scroll, and, the, and every mountain is shaken out of its place. These are terrible descriptions of what, would, what is going to happen in the world to come, in this world uh, that we live in. These are things that God says they must be. These are not things that God delights in. These are not things that, uh, that the Bible simply says that they will be. It says they must be. And without them, God's purposes cannot go forward. And it's interesting that in chapter 4 and 5, and uh, I'm not intending to go through every chapter in, in Revelation, but in chapter 4 and 5, what in my mind seems to be happening is this, that God is setting out His rights to do what he is about to do in the great tribulation on the earth. It's really a terrible time of suffering. And of course, the big question, well, even in our day, uh, you'll remember a few years ago, uh, well, it seems a few years ago, the older, older ones, but um, that uh, we went into Iraq, you'll remember, uh, and, and uh, a few years ago in the Gulf War, and of course, the great firepower that was used there in Iraq, and it was all justified. And then, of course, after the war, the big question was, was it really justified? Was it a righteous thing? Or were we deceived? And were we basing everything on false evidence? Or were there lies involved? And, of course, T Tony Blair must have lost a few nights sleep over that. Was it a righteous thing? Well, God is telling us here that what he's about to do in the world is a righteous thing. The question is, is, it, is he worthy? And, of course, the answer is that he is worthy. He is worthy. It is a right thing that the Lord does. And so desperate are these days that you have this question um, at the end of chapter 6, which kind of tees up our um, chapter tonight. It says, The great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? Who will survive the great day of the wrath of God? It's, it's an expression of despair from those who are fleeing from the judgment that's coming upon the earth. Well, God stops there, and he just tells us who will stand. In the chapter we have read of, uh, we will we read of two different congregations, two different companies, um, and they, they both stand and they survive this terrible day of God's wrath on the earth. Not everyone will be destroyed. There will be people who will stand in that day. And it's really quite amazing. There is two groups that are described here. There is the 144,000, a very specifically numbered group. And then at the end of the chapter, there's a group that the Bible says that no man could number. The first group that we read of is specifically Jewish from the, the nation of Israel. It goes down every tribe and it tells us that there was 12,000 out of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's a Jewish congregation, the 144,000. You may get somebody coming to your door, a Jehovah Witness, he will tell you that the 144,000 are certain believers that go to heaven, the rest stay on earth. But that's not the teaching of Scripture. They're Jewish, very clearly. You can see that a mile away. It says it. It says it 12 times. Um, and then, of course, the other group is out of every tribe and tongue and nation. And so it's a different group. Um, it says about the first group, 
or at least it pictures the first group as they are going into the tribulation. These seven years are terrible uh, suffering on earth. Uh, we'll see that when we come to look at their, what it says about them. But they are going into the tribulation, and the other group are coming out of the tribulation. When the tribulation is past, they are coming out, and they also have survived. Who will stand in the day of judgment? Well, that's a fair question for us to be asking. It's a fair question for everybody to be asking. Who can stand in the day of God's judgment? Well, the first group you could describe as the sealed. Because you saw that there was an angel came in it, and it put a seal on them, a mark on them, that said these people belong to God. They were sealed. The second group, of the, they were saved. They sang a song to the Lord, salvation belongs to the Lord. So the sealed and the saved, they stand in the day of God's judgment. And you know, it is an astonishing thing that in the time... In the time when the, God's greatest judgment is coming on the world, God's greatest blessing comes on the world at the same time. It is something that uh, is typically God. It's typically Christ. It's typically the God of mercy. You know, I was thinking about um, Habakkuk. Habakkuk was... Uh, um, a prophet who lived in the Old Testament and he was just living uh, in dread of the judgment of God coming because he knew it was coming and it was the Assyrians that was going to come and, and he was horrified to think that God would use such a, a wicked group of men to judge his own dear people but uh, eventually he had to accept it and he had to accept that this was what was going to happen but he had a prayer and his prayer was this in wrath remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And that's what's going to happen in the great tribulation. Yes, it's a day of God's wrath and God's judgment on the world, but there's mercy. God remembers mercy. And there'll still be people saved out of the great tribulation. And that's what we're going to read about, or we have read about it tonight in this passage. You know, at the start of the, of the tribulation, there's going to be a situation where there'll be nobody saved on earth. There'll be no believers on the earth. And that's because the church is uh, raptured away to glory. And so when I say the church, I mean every true believer in the Lord Jesus is taken out of this world um, and is in heaven with the Lord Jesus and goes through the judgment seat of Christ and all these sort of things, but uh, is gone out of the world. And God, as it were, has left himself uh, without a witness in the world, uh, there is no believer on the world. Uh, the Bible says that the thing that restrains this world will be taken out of the way, and there will be an eruption of wickedness in the world. Now, we think the world is a, is a wicked place, but, you know, just you wait. No, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait around to see it, and you're not going to wait around to see it, but just, you know, in time it shall be seen just the wickedness of man, wickedness of man. I was quite surprised to hear, um, was it the, the top guy in the, in the UN, uh, he said that war is inconceivable in 2022. War is inconceivable in uh, you know, the, the day that we live in. And I thought to myself, he doesn't know what's going to come. He doesn't know what's about to break in this world. And you always get to think like that. I can remember, you know, when the Russians was on the edge of um, uh, Ukraine, I thought to myself, they'll never invade. Because, you know, I should have gotten better. I should have, because the heart of man is the same. It hasn't changed. But I just thought that with communications the way they are and international things the way, and globalization, I thought they wouldn't do that these days, surely. Of course they would do it these days. And things, oh, anyway, that's, that's by the way. But things are going to get worse uh, as, as the Bible reveals it. <clears throat> but God um, has put almost, in our chapter, he's put a hold on things. And he has, he has, as the word comes to the four angels that are holding the winds, the four winds on the earth, all sort of pictorial language, symbolic, that the judgment of God is about to come on the earth in the tribulation. The winds of adversity are just about to blast the earth, the whole earth, 
uh, the four corners of the, of the world. These four angels are just about to do their utmost uh, in judgment on the world. And the world, the word is, hold on, hold, hold, stop. Don't let it happen. Hold it back. Because there's a fifth angel. There's another angel, and he's coming from the east. And, uh, you know, I love that. I love that. You know, five in the Bible, it always speaks of God's grace and human weakness. And here, the judgment of God is just about to come on the earth. But there is a fifth angel that comes from the east. And, and of course, you know that in the Bible, uh, the east always is God's, it's always where God comes from. It's the temple was towards the east. And the Lord came from the east gate into the city. And that's just how you always find that in Scripture. In fact, we were looking at Genesis in our own Bible study, and it says that the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden. And in a sense, he put, he put Adam just down the road. He put it on a, near to himself. And so there is an angel comes from God in the east, and it's the fifth angel, and he's coming in grace. And he says, no judgment must fall on the world until these 144,000 people are sealed and are made the servants of God. And you know, this is a wonderful thing to know that, you know, the Lord never leaves himself without witness. God's grace is such that even though his judgment is about to fall on the earth, he seals these group, this massive group of people, Jewish people. And uh, <clears throat> why Jewish people? Well, today the Bible says that in Christ there is no Jew nor Gentile. <clears throat> and what that really means is that, you know, once we trust in Christ, we're all the same. We're all one in Christ. We're all blessed to the same level. We're all part of the bride of Christ. But now that the church is gone, God has gone back to deal directly with his people, Israel, and he seals these 144,000 out of Israel to be his servants, to be his servants as the judgment is about to come on the world. <clears throat> You know, there's just so many numbers in Revelation, we know all this, but uh, 12 is the number of perfect administration and perfect rule. And these, there are 12 tribes here, uh, there are 12,000 in every tribe, 144,000. <clears> when you go into all the details, you'll see there's some tribes that are not mentioned. Uh, there are some tribes that you wouldn't have thought would be there. There's a tribe of Joseph, which is a strange one because there isn't really a tribe of Joseph in Israel. But it's just different. And I think what it's saying here is that in that day, some of Israel will be saved. You know, if we were to turn further over, we would find about this group that they are redeemed from the earth. Um, they, they have the witness of the Lamb. These are people who are saved right at the beginning of the tribulation. And they're saved for a purpose, and their purpose is to be the servants of God and to bring the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ into the tribulation. Amidst all this judgment and wrath that's fallen from heaven, there is a word that's coming from these men, and God wants to seal them. He wants to protect them during these terrible days of judgment that they might carry out the work that, they ha that he has uh, for them to do. <clears throat> You know, there may be a little time. How long do the angels hold on? I don't know. There may be a little time while these people get converted, uh, 144,000. It's not, it's a big number, but it's only, it's less than 1% of the Jewish nation today. So it's not all the Jewish nation that's saved, it's some. It's some that repent and trust in the Lord Jesus. We know that the Jewish nation has to go through a terrible time, uh, a, t a turmoil in this period, but there are some. The Bible calls them the first fruits of the rapture, sorry, the, the tribulation. They are the first fruits unto God. The whole nation will be saved one day, but this is the first fruits, and they're saved early in the tribulation. You know, I cannot help but think, and I really couldn't bring Scripture to, oh, well, I could, yes. <laughs> it's always good if you can bring Scripture to bear on it. Um, you know, I think what's going to happen, I think what, shall, what will speak to this group so early in the tribulation, just as before it begins really, I think it will be the rapture of the church. I think it will be the rapture of the church. I think when the church goes, that these people have their eyes opened. In fact, the Lord Jesus says this. 
He says, I will cause them to know that I have loved you. That's what God says to that faithful church that was waiting for his return. And they were suffering uh, uh, persecution from Jews. And he says, I will let them who say they are Jews but are not. In other words, the Lord was saying that they say they are Jews, but spiritually they're not. But he says, I will let them know that I loved you. And I think there's going to come a revelation in that day among the Jewish nation that that church was right. Those Christians were right. What they said about the Messiah was right. And I think that will speak to this group. And I think it will, through that, many of them will come to Christ. And you have a lovely picture in the Old Testament. Um, in the Old Testament, you'll remember of Joseph, and there was like seven years of plenty, and then there was seven years of famine. You'll remember that. And it's a lovely picture. The seven years of plenty speaks about the day of grace in which we live, when there is plenty, spiritually speaking. The gospel is going out. We live uh, in conditions where God is not dealing in judgment on the earth. He's dealing in grace with men. And anyone can come to Christ and find salvation in the day that we're living. God is not judging people for their sin like he will be in that day. And uh, so that's a lovely picture of that. But in the years of starvation, the years of famine, which pictures the tribulation, what, what, what did they survive on? They survived on the, the goodness that was stored away in the years of plenty. And you know what I think? I think that the ministry or the church that will remain here on earth will lead many of these people to trust in the Lord. You know what I mean? You know, Graham's messages on, in, in, the, in the internet. Everybody's, you know, the internet has just been jammed packed with gospel and, and uh, Bible teaching. So much so, even in these days of COVID, it's, it's increased probably a hundredfold. And, and the, the wealth of material, spiritual truth that's been stored up in the years of plenty will be a great blessing in the years of famine when there's not a saved person on the earth and it will be used to awaken these people. And of course, we have that words of the Lord Jesus that he will pour his spirit upon the Jewish nation. And, uh, and in that day, the day when the moon shall turn to blood, and the sun shall be darkened. You read about it in the Old Testament that God will pour His Spirit. And so these people get saved early in the tribulation and uh, they are sealed and protected by God as they enter into this terrible uh, time of suffering. And their seal is very um, clear. God's name is written upon their forehead. Now, whether that's outward or inward, I don't know. You know, there is a lovely thing that says that we are sealed, sealed by the Spirit of God. And we've become God's um, property. God puts his mark upon us when we're saved. He says, when you believed, you were sealed by that spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance. And so, God has sealed us to be his, and he does the same with this group here. And so, that is the first group that we're thinking about tonight. <clears throat> the sealed, those that are sealed by the seal of God. <clears throat> and as I say, their, their job, I believe, um, as servants of God would be to have, and it says about them, that they have the witness of Jesus Christ. They have the witness of Jesus Christ. You know, what a, what a day that will be when these Jewish nationals come to realize uh, who Jesus really was. And I was just thinking about this, and, you know, the Word of God is amazing. It actually tells us what they'll say. It says, what they will say will be something like this, that we thought that he was stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's going to be an amazing day for these Jewish folk to realize what the cross was all about. Well, that's a glorious day for them, I'm sure. 
<clears throat> when we come to this second group uh, that we read of here, a great multitude which no one could number of every, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, uh, verse 9. This is the result. What I think we're seeing here is the result of the work of these witnesses of God. I think what God puts his servants in, as it were, he sows his servants in at the start of these terrible years that the world will experience. And out of it comes this massive crowd that no man can number. You know, it's an astonishing group, really. It is an astonishing group. You see, we said earlier that at the start of the tribulation, um, there will be nobody saved on the earth because every saved person will be raptured to glory. But, you know, at the end of the tribulation, when God's judgment is over and judgments are all past, there will only be saved people on the earth. And here they are, out of every tribe and tongue and nation, a multitude that nobody can number. You know, God is very specific about his number, 144,000, 12,000 out of every, every tribe. Because that's like coming from God's side. God is sealing them, and God knows every one of them. But this is like man trying to count this massive crowd, and it's just far too big. It cannot be numbered. This is what we're looking at here in this group, is the population of the world in the initial days of the kingdom of God on earth. That's massive. To think that here is, that is a tremendous fruit for their labor, isn't it? A number that nobody could measure. And it says that they're clothed in white robes. They're clothed in white robes. And uh, of course, we know that that always speaks of righteousness, which is the righteousness of the saints. Uh, you'll remember the scripture says, all our righteousness, our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that's how we stand before God. And it doesn't say that all our wickedness is as filthy rags. It says all our righteousness, the best that we can do, is as filthy rags. But we know that through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it cleanses us from all sin. And God grants those, and grants those, these people here, um, these robes of righteousness before his throne. Their, their sin is absolutely forgiven. I love what it says about them here. It says that they came out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is something that they did. They washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, it's great how the, um, the Lord describes His work among men. The first group that we, we read of here, it was like something that God did. He sealed them. This angel just came and, and, and sealed 144,000 people. We don't read anything that they did. And you know, that's like one aspect of our salvation. It's something that God does 100%. He makes us aware of our sin. Uh, he opens our eyes to see Christ. We come to Christ. It's His work in us. But in another aspect, it's something that we do. And it's something that they did. They washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of of the Lamb. And that's such a lovely expression, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who gave himself for us. Have you washed your robes? Can I just ask that question? Because it's up to you. You know, the hymn that I, I really like at the moment, um, and uh, I always say it's by Crystal Gale, but it's not Crystal Gale, I think it's Charity Gale's her name. And uh, she sings this lovely song, and it's, Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. I just love that, like, because it's not even, thank you, Jesus, for the blood. Well, that's great as well. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross, but thank you for applying it to my life. Thank you for washing me in that blood. Have you washed your robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb? That's a lovely song. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. It's a wonderful truth. And so they, had, they were saved people, washed their robes in the white of the Lamb, and it says about them that they had palm branches in their hands. Palm branches in their hands. Now, of course, all these pictures refer back to other things and tie the whole Scripture together, sews it all up together. And, uh, of course, we're thinking about the palm branches, and we're thinking about the Lord Jesus. 
and he's coming in his kingly glory. A king, a, oh, sorry, not his kingly glory, but he's coming as king, a, riding upon the colt, the foal of an ass, the donkey, into Jerusalem. And they're taking ba- palm branches and they're casting them down before him. And they're saying, Hosanna, uh, save now. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And it's a picture of the coming of king in his glory. And of course, this is what we're seeing here. This is not the beginning of the tribulation. This is the end of the tribulation. This is the king coming in mighty power and glory. And this group here, they're ready for him. And they're waving palm branches. And they're saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come in all his kingly power and, 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 and in judgment, true. But they are ready for him. And they're waiting for the king to come. So this is what we're saying here, that into the kingdom, into the tribulation goes these servants. Out of the kingdom comes this mighty harvest of souls. And you know, this elder... Um, I'm sorry, before that, it says that heaven joins in with a song of praise. The song is this, that salvation belongs to God and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to God. I love that. There's just a bit of intelligence about that. There's just the whole story in a nutshell there. It's God that saves, but he saves through the Lamb. I love the truth. They're just saved the same way as we're saved. They just saw that Jesus died for them. And they said, that's good enough for me. And the song of of, of worship to God is salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. And of course, heaven is so affected by their song, even though they are still on earth, that heaven bursts out in praise. Angels and elders and living creatures are all touched by this great harvest of souls that's coming in the future. So there is a great... Now, there's lots of folk that are kind of hanging on um, for the great revival. And you're, you're going to hear probably... You probably hear people speaking about the great revival that's going to come. Well, I hope it does come. Um, and, of course, Revive Scotland is on this year, and they're looking for a revival. And we're all looking for a revival. But, you know, this revival that we hear about here... This is the end time harvest of souls. And it's nothing to do with the church. It's not in the church age. We won't be there when it happens. But God will show his mercy in the middle of his wrath and judgment. That is our God. In wrath, he will remember mercy. And he will populate a new heavens and a new earth in his kingdom out of this terrible time of suffering. You see, when, as this tribulation continues and progresses, there will be no doubt that God is moving in this world. People will recognize the hand of God in it, and many will turn to the Lord. Many will not. And in fact, as you read through Revelation, you'll find that many times it says, and they repented not, and they repented not, and they repented, but some do, some do repent. And wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. And here they are, standing. Who will stand? Who who will survive this terrible day of judgment? The Lord will see to it that many will survive. Now, don't be holding on, thinking that you... I'll just wait and see then. You know, when you were... uh, Well, if you were brought up in church and you heard about these things, you were always afraid that the Lord would come and you'd be left behind. And... Because you thought, well, because the Bible tells us that those that are left behind will be lost. And I think that's true to say that. And I'm, I'm not going to quote scripture, but you'll find in the second uh, Thessalonians that God sends a delusion. Uh, and the people who rejected the truth and chose sin over the truth will not have another opportunity to be saved. But there'll be folks that never heard it. And there were a great harvest of souls in that day. You know, I had a friend, um, I knew a man who, who <coughs> was holding on to this belief, and still does to the day, that there will be a great end time revival in the church. And uh, he wrote some books because he believed that when um, 
So many people got saved that there would just not be enough teachers to teach the truth. And so he wrote these books for a great end time revival. Well, I think his great, his faith uh, will be honored in that day because there is coming a great end time. Maybe not in the church days. I don't think so much, so much in the church days, but in the tribulation. And his material will be used and will be feeding the souls of these uh, folks in this uh, a revival of which we have read. And I just want to start by asking a few questions. <clears throat> How come 144,000 in seven years could produce such a massive harvest of souls? I mean, how many folks have we seen saved in Scotland? Well, I haven't a clue, like, number-wise. It would be, be quite a big number. But in seven years, to see a whole world full of people actually almost saved. And it's quite interesting because in chapter 14, you get to see another glimpse of this 144,000. Now, I don't know if I'm allowed to look at that. Great, I mean, somebody else picked it for, the 100, for chapter 14. We're not going to turn to it, but in chapter 14, if you want to turn to it later, um, we'll read, you will have an interesting glimpse of this 144,000. And they're not going into the tribulation here. What we're actually looking at, it's like the Victory Day Parade. It's the Victory Day Parade. And the 144,000 are, st- are there, and they're, as it were, presented to the king uh, as, as servants of God. And uh, we'll learn some things about them. And uh, I just think that there are a few things here that we can learn about how they were so effective in their witness to Christ. And I think, first of all, that they had a song, a new song that they sang that celebrated their own salvation. In other words, here was a group of people, 144,000, that were so glad to be saved. They were just full of it. They were full of it. And you know, that's what David says. Lord, he says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Then I will teach sinners your way. And I just thought, if we wanted to be more effective, if we had a greater joy in our salvation. I can remember when I was younger, um, I used to listen to all preachers, and they used to say, how good, it's good to be saved. They say, it's good to be saved. And I'd say, oh, it's fine, we're not going to hell. Okay? But that's not what they meant. They meant, it's so enjoyable to be saved. And so it is. And so it is. And if you're saved tonight, and you're not really enjoying it, come to the Lord, come to His Word, fellowship with other believers, trust in what you read in the Bible, read about Christ, and the Lord will restore to you the joy of salvation. And if we were happier, more hopeful, more rejoicing believers, that were singing out of our hearts in appreciation of what we have in Jesus, I think we might more an effect in the world in which we're living. We're not here to spoil life. We're not here to be spoiled sports. We're here to enjoy life as God wants people to have it. And so they had this song that they sang, even in tribulation. Of course, you'll remember Paul and Silas. You can hardly read the clock for here. You can't. I struggle to read the clock here in the Bucky Baptist Church. No, I've got to watch here, so I have no excuse. And... Uh, <coughs> Paul and Silas in the jail at Philippi, I remember they sang praises to God while their feet were stuck in the, sh- in, in, the, in, the, in the prison, in the stocks. They were in the stocks and, they'd be, and they were singing praise to God and they awoke the whole prison spiritually. They have a song that they sing. And then there was something else. They were all single. Stop for effect. <laughs> they were all single. Now, what I mean by that is the Bible says about them in ch- chapter 14, they were not defiled by women. Sorry, sorry, ladies. But that's what it says. It says that they were not defiled by women. Now, you can look at that in two ways. Maybe it means, well, I'm not going to get into all that, but <laughs> sometimes it's better to say what it, not to say what it means than to say what it does mean. But I think we'll take Paul's example. Paul says, to the believers, to, to, to some of the, to the brothers. He says, brothers, he says, 
Um, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, But this I say, brothers, the time is short, so that from now on, even they that have wives should be as though they had none. What Paul is emphasizing there, he's not saying you should dump your wife by any way. <laughs> but what he's saying is this. You know, time is short. We need to be devoted to Christ. We need to be serving the Lord. And these, it says about these people that they were virgins. They, were, they had no partners. They were totally devoted to the service that they were involved in. And of course, the Lord says that there are people who make this choice in life, not to be married, but to simply serve the Lord with all that they have. And uh, he, commands, he commends them for that. But even those of us who are married and involved with other things, and he goes on, he doesn't just speak about marriage, but he speaks about your business, and he speaks about your work, and he speaks about different things. And what Paul has encouraged them is saying, don't let these things distract you from your main job. Time is short. Time is short. And these people were totally devoted to serving the Lamb. What about us? Are we totally devoted to Christ? Could we not be more devoted to Christ? Wasn't it D.L. Moody that said the world, or somebody said it to him, I think, but he quoted it. He says, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man or woman. I'll put that in. Dale Moody could go off and just saying a man, but we can't do that today. Fully consecrated to God. The world has yet to see what God can do with somebody that is fully consecrated to Him. And he said this, and by God's help, I aim to be that man. And D.L. Moody was massively used by the Lord for his glory. And the challenge comes to you and to me tonight. Do you aim to be that person? Do I aim to be that person? You know, sometimes there are many of us and the Lord and the church and the service of God is not the main thing. It's other stuff. It's business. It's pleasure. It's, oh, well, we, we never miss a Sunday like, but as long as it's just a Sunday, it's near 100%. The world has yet to see. Is there somebody here that can say, I aim to be that person? Then we would maybe be a bit more effective. Like these were effective. And seeing such a massive. Uh, return on their service for the Lord. They followed the Lamb wherever He went. I like that. That's what they did. They weren't distracted by other stuff. They followed the Lamb wherever He went. Ah, oh, that would be great to be living like that, eh? Just to know where the Lord wanted you to be. Just to be following Him. Just to be every day getting up and saying, Lord, what is it today? And maybe you do that. God bless you if you do. Because that's what He wants for us. He's bought us with a price. We're not our own. And then finally, they were effective because they preached the everlasting gospel. They preached the everlasting gospel. And you know, it's a wonderful thing to know that in that day, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ is still preached. Now, it might be called the gospel of the kingdom, but it's the same gospel. It's called the gospel of the kingdom because the people who get saved through that gospel will live in His kingdom here on earth. It's the gospel that brings people into the kingdom. But it's the same gospel. And you remember what Paul says, if any man or if any angel preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. There is no other gospel. It's concerning Jesus Christ. It's concerning the one who loved us and gave Himself for us. It's the matter of sin between us and God that can be cleansed away through the blood of the Lamb. And they preach that everlasting gospel with all their might. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Let us preach the gospel. Let us follow the Lamb wherever, wherever he, he, he leads us. Let us 
rejoice in our salvation. And it may be that we also, in that march past in glory, will we'll hear that word from the, from the Lord Jesus. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the rest of the Lord. Amen. May God bless his word to our hearts tonight. <clears throat>